Dear friends, thank you again for joining me for this fifth podcast, A Virtual Journey in the Footsteps of Jesus. And uh, in this podcast, we're going to travel with Jesus to Jerusalem in preparation for the Passion. Now, in the, uh, in the last uh, podcast, we looked specifically at uh, the first two phases of Jesus' ministry. Uh, in the first phase, as we saw, uh, Jesus uh, concentrated his missionary work on the so-called ministry triangle between Capernaum, Chorazin, and Bethsaida. These are all places that could be accessed in a day's march. In the second phase, we saw that Jesus started to use the boat of his fishermen disciples to visit various places around the Sea of Galilee, notably Magdala, the place of Mary Magdalene. And in the third phase, Jesus decided to go beyond the borders of Galilee and explore the Gentile regions that surrounded this province, particularly because he was intrigued by the fact that so many people from the surrounding areas, which were predominantly Greek, which were Gentile, still came to hear him, even though uh, his teachings were always primarily focused on the so-called lost sheep of Israel. And let's start with, with that part, the, the phase, phase three. And what we see is that Jesus uh, leaves the border of Galilee and goes into the territory of Tyre and Sidon, two very prominent places in Phoenicia, which had uh, been uh, ha thoroughly Hellenized, which means under Greek influence for, for a very long time. The region of Tyre, for example, that the uh, evangelists talk about, was a very prominent uh, port city today located in Lebanon. In fact, some people believe it is one of the oldest continuously uh, inhabited places in the world. And here in this region uh, of Tyre, Jesus met a Gentile woman who obviously was familiar with his teachings. And she approached Jesus and said, you know, my, my daughter, she's, she's very sick. She's very ill with an an unclean spirit, and so asked Jesus to heal her. Now, we know Jesus to be a very compassionate figure, very kind and merciful figure, but I must admit the response that Jesus gave this Gentile woman was not very nice. He said, uh, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And this is a not so subtle reference to the way Jews looked upon Gentiles as people who clearly didn't adhere to the purity laws, who didn't um, uh, eat kosher foods, who adhere to Greek customs. And uh, so the reference to dogs as, as Gentiles is not a very uh, uh, politically correct one, shall we say. But then uh, this mother came back with a repartee. She said, well, you know, Jesus, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And so, and, and she said in a way that, you know, you may not think that we Gentiles are God's chosen people, but we are still yearning for God's grace. And Jesus, to his great credit, immediately accepted that rebuke and said, uh, was deeply impressed by the woman's faith. And, and he said, oh gosh, you know, you go home. And when you come home, uh, your daughter will be healed. And of course, um, when the mother came home, indeed, her young daughter was, was well. Now, I find this to be an extremely important passage in the story of Jesus. Perhaps outside the Passion, the most important moment in everything that we have seen so far, because it really made him confront the fact uh, that his ministry, uh, while not terribly successful in Galilee, obviously found great resonance with people for whom he really hadn't intended his teachings to begin with, the, the, the Gentiles. And again, uh, previously, he always 
said to his followers that my teachings, my instruction, the kingdom of God program is for the lost sheep of Israel only. This experience, this journey into this Gentile territory gave him pause. And what's so interesting is that at, after this experience, Jesus does not go back to Galilee. What he does is he cuts across and visits Panias or Banyas, as it's called today in the north, north of Israel. Now, Panias is a very odd place to reflect on your ministry as a rabbi because Panias was for centuries known as a sanctuary devoted to the Greek god Pan, who is sort of the messenger of the gods um, and the, the, the FedEx agency of the gods, if you will. And so it was a very pagan sanctuary. And in fact, just in the years before Jesus' visit to this place, uh, Herod Philip, who, as we saw in a previous podcast, was the ruler of this area, the Golanitis, a very pagan Gentile area, he had decided to turn it into um, a luxury spa. There was really no other way to describe it because there was a, a, a spring, a beautiful spring, uh, nearby. And in those days in the Roman Empire, there was such a thing as religious tourism. Uh, people obviously went to many places that were considered sacred, such as, for example, the holy, the island of Delos in, in Greece, which was associated with the worship of Apollo. And when people did that, they sort of turned it into a vacation. You know, they took their kids and, and uh, they camped out. And, and so uh, religious tourism, the idea of blending a getaway with a religious purpose was a, a very well-known uh, feature in the Roman Empire at that time. And Herod Philip, with his great sense of marketing, uh, decided to exploit it. And so uh, in the years just before the arrival of Jesus, this had become a very well-known, uh, I'm not sure it was a four-star resort, but it was a very popular resort for uh, Greco-Roman citizens uh, to visit the place, worship the god, and then enjoy the springs and the fine wine and the other facilities that the sanctuary had to offer. So it is, it is a rather odd place uh, for a rabbi to visit. And interestingly enough, uh, Herod Philip called it Caesarea Philippi. Now, of course, uh, as we saw previously, when rulers like Antipas or Philip built a city, which was obviously a major undertaking, they always rushed to uh, uh, attribute it or give it a name uh, that uh, uh, sort of uh, honored the ruler of the Roman Empire at that time, the emperor. And so Caesarea is, of course, uh, the root of that word is Caesar, the word of the emperor. Julius Caesar, of course, was the first uh, person to be ruler, uh, I won't say a dictator, but certainly uh, a ruler of the Roman Empire, taking the power away from the Roman Senate. And so you see that all of the subsequent emperors, including his grandnephew Augustus and then Tiberius, they all sort of arrogated that title of Caesar as a honorific uh, of their role as emperor. And so Caesarea is not necessarily a tribute to Julius Caesar, but to the reigning emperor of that time, which in this case, after Augustus, was Tiberius. Now, of course, we all know that there was another Caesarea, uh, Caesarea which we saw in the previous podcast, the Caesarea built by Herod the Great, King Herod, uh, on the border of the Mediterranean uh, Sea. So in order to distinguish it from that city, he called it Caesarea Philippi, of course, referring to himself, Philip, in a very modest way. And that's how these sons of Herod try to not only mark their reign, but also, of course, to uh, get some revenue for, for their treasure. So in any case, uh, Panias, apart from the fact that it had this pagan connotation, was a beautiful place. It is still a very beautiful place to this day. Uh, tourism to uh, Banyas, as it's called today, has been curtailed by the fact that it's really just uh, a few miles from the border with Syria. Of course, the Syrian civil war is still raging there. So uh, 
Um, it's not necessarily a place that many folks go to, but I found it to be a place of great peace and tranquility and reflection. And I think it's here that Jesus takes a moment to reflect on what he has achieved up to this time. Now, I know this is a surprise to many of you, but in my book, I, I argue that uh, the ministry of Jesus could not have been more than anywhere from nine to 12 months, perhaps 18 months, but not, not more. And that's a surprise to many people. But according to the Synoptic Gospels, if you look at that, there is only one reference to Passover, which of course was the primary event on the Jewish calendar during the Second Temple period. I mean, you could not uh, avoid going to Jerusalem for Passover. And if for any reason you didn't, then clearly there was a reason for that. So the ministry of Jesus, I believe, was incredibly short, certainly compared to people like Jeremiah or other prophets who, who had a whole lifetime to develop and hone and polish their, their ministry and the message of their ministry. Uh, in, in this case, Jesus only had a very, very short period of time to develop this program of the kingdom of God, which is, I think, one reason why so many of his followers were still confused about what that really meant. In any case, it is here in this beautiful place of Panias, or Caesarea Philippi, as Mark accurately refers to it, that Jesus asks a very fundamental question to his followers. He says, you know, after all what I've done in Galilee, of all the miracles I've done, all the healings I've done, all the, the sermons I've given, what do people think that I am? What do they think I am? And the disciples, they sort of look at each other and they scratch their beards and, you know, they say, well, you know, some say, uh, you're, you're John, like John the Baptist. Uh, others say, uh, well, you, you're like one of the Hebrew prophets, like Elijah, you know. And, and Jesus stares at them. You know, you can imagine the scene, you know, these, these apostles, they, they sort of shuffle their feet and say, oh, my God, we're really put on the spot right now. And then only Simon, uh, uh, Simon says when, when, when Jesus says, yeah, but I don't want to know what, what you think. Oh, boy, that's a difficult question. And only Simon, Simon Peter says, you are the Messiah. And boy, what, a, what an incredible moment that is, you know. And, and of course, Peter at that point has become sort of Jesus' right-hand man. That's why Jesus gives him a nickname. You know, Peter's name was not Peter. It was Simon. Uh, but, but Jesus gives him a, a nickname, uh, which is Petros. And so uh, we, would, we should translate that the way it is in Greek, which is Rocky, you know. And so Jesus refers to Simon as Rocky. You're my Rocky. You're, you're Rocky. And, and Rocky, uh, true to his name, is the rock of Jesus' ministry. He says, you know what? I figured it out. You are the Messiah. And I think this is the crucial turning point. Because Jesus says, well, if you know that, but if so many of my followers know that, and if we go back to Galilee and we see that, that really very few people have changed in response to my kingdom of God program, then what have I really accomplished? And here you find a very uncharacteristic outburst in, in, in the, the Synoptic Gospels. You know, as we saw in the beginning, phase one, this is where Jesus concentrated his initial ministry. This is where he did tremendous amount of healings and miracles, uh, Capernaum, Chorazin, Bethsaida. And then you have this, this, this really emotional outburst that Jesus says, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. If the powerful deeds performed among you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, obviously referring to the faith of that mother that he encountered, they would have changed their ways long ago. And here again, it's a terrible accusation saying that, you know, if the Gentiles can have faith, how come you don't have faith? That's, that's a tremendous, tremendously 
important and, and, and damning outburst that he, he gives here. And, and in fact, the worst is reserved for the city that was the, the headquarters of his movement, the very base of his movement. And he says, and you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? Uh, of course, a paraphrase of the kingdom of heaven in Matthew. Matthew refers to the kingdom of God as the kingdom of heaven. Matthew is, is obviously very pious as a Jew, and many Jews in the second, second temple period avoided the name of Yahweh. They would refer to it obliquely as Hashem, the name, rather than God or the Lord. And so uh, in Matthew, you see that instead of kingdom of God, he calls it the kingdom of heaven. And so uh, will Capernaum be considered the capital of the kingdom of heaven? No, he says, you will be brought down to Hades, which of course is uh, Sheol, uh, the, the underworld where some Jews, not many, but some Jews believe that people would go after, after death. So this is, this is an incredible indictment of not only these three cities, but more importantly, of the success of his ministry. I mean, it's deeply frustrating for someone like Jesus who poured so much energy into his ministry to then come to the realization that the very core towns and communities where he has been working have basically turned their back on him. And this is when uh, you see that moment of reflection that started in, in Panius, and, and that's when, when Jesus really refers back to what the other prophets have done in a similar situation. And, and I think, and this is my interpretation, that one of the role models for Jesus' ministry was Jeremiah. Uh, there were others, uh, Micah, Amos, but like those prophets, uh, they faced the same situation that Jesus confronted, which was a growing uh, uh, cleft, a growing uh, abyss between the haves and have-nots, uh, particularly in the 8th century, but certainly in the 7th century, a time of great prosperity in the kingdom of Judah under King Josiah, uh, when you see that the merchant class becomes very, very wealthy and then starts to exploit the uh, farmer's class by, um, by levying great taxes and mortgage rates and interest rates. And the situation is very similar to what Jesus confronted as we saw. And, and what, what Jeremiah uh, said is that when he confronted that challenge of how to redeem this, this great division in Israel's society, that God told him, you know what you should do, Jeremiah? You should go to the temple. You should stand in the gate of the Lord's house and say this. Hear the word of the Lord. All you people of Judah, come together and hear the word of, the God, of God. And I think this is what Jesus decided to do. And, and I, uh, the result is one of the most magnificent sermons in Hebrew scripture, which is Jeremiah's temple sermon. And uh, I think that became sort of the impetus for Jesus to do the same for, for the very simple reason that, as we will see shortly, he actually cites, he quotes from Jeremiah's temple sermon. So I really believe that this was one of the reasons why he then decided, you know, the, the next logical move for me as part of my ministry is to go to Jerusalem. And the timing actually was very auspicious. Uh, the Jewish month of Nisan had begun, which is roughly equivalent to our late March, early April. And this is the time when thousands of Jews throughout uh, the diaspora, not just in, in the Near East, but throughout the diaspora, would gather uh, in Jerusalem for Passover, the holiest of the three main fest festivals of the Second Temple period. Uh, but there was great danger to do that. Uh, and many of the pilgrims who came to Jerusalem then were, were very apprehensive because as we saw in my previous podcast, it was just two months since the, two years, I'm sorry, two years since the great massacre that 
uh, Pontius Pilate, not a nice guy at all, uh, had occasioned in the forecourt of the temple where thousands of people, simple families would come to the temple where a demonstration was, ha was happening um, at the time against the design, the plan of Pilate and Caiaphas to use temple funds to build an aqueduct. Uh, at that time, as I, as I told you earlier, a pilot had uh, sent his soldiers into the forecourt and they had killed everyone in sight. Not just the people who happened to be demonstrating peacefully against the so-called aqueduct uh, plan, but also people who just come to the temple to worship they, or to, to bring their tithes to make a sacrifice or simply to show their family the beautiful building. They too were cut down. So for many people, this was a, a moment for to say, well, you know, obviously our faith requires us to go to Passover and to make a sacrifice in the temple, but is this really a smart thing to do right now? And uh, it's so wonderful that Mark expresses that perfectly. You know, I think Mark's gospel has sort of been short shrift because, you know, most of our uh, Sunday worship tends to cite Matthew and Luke, because they are more uh, literate, they are better writers, they are such wonderful storytellers. But Mark's, which is the first gospel, and therefore very close to the oral tradition that uh, carried the message of Jesus, the story of Jesus, is, is a really good reporter as well, a really good storyteller as well. And he says, you know, so they were on the road. Jesus has said, you know, guess what? We're going to Passover, okay? Follow in line, here we go. And uh, they're on the road, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, you know, full of vigor and full of, full of faith, already thinking through what he was going to say when he would come to the forecourt of, of Jerusalem. And they and the, and the disciples who followed, you know what? They were afraid. They were afraid be, uh, precisely of what happened here uh, two years earlier. And uh, one of the evangelists even refers to that, you know, the fact that Pilate had mingled the blood of the innocents with those who came to sacrifice. So it was a very well, even then, and I'm talking the second half of the first century when the evangelists wrote, the massacre of 28 AD was still very much in people's minds. Now, there was something really wonderful happened as, as they, they marched down uh, to Jerusalem. And there were two ways to do that. One was through the territory of Samaria. That's where John's gospel places uh, the journey to Jerusalem, the road to Jerusalem. But the synoptic gospels place the road to Jerusalem through along the River Jordan. And if you follow that, I've, I've followed that road several times. Uh, the, the main city that you pass along the way is Jericho. After Jericho, you, you have to face a very steep Incline today we do that by car those poor folks had to do it on foot but jericho one of the oldest cities again in in the world in the civilization was actually the place where herod the great had built one of his palaces precisely because of its its very uh, nice climate jericho was was dry and warm of course but it was also close to the jordan and that's why herod had in uh, one of the things that augustus had given him was a beautiful uh, plantation of palm trees, if you believe that. Uh, palm trees, who, uh, an, a, a plantation originally developed by none other than Cleopatra of Egypt. Interesting how all these famous uh, celebrities um, from ancient history intersect. Uh, so anyway, as we saw previously in our story of the kingdom of God, Jesus deliberately went out of his way to sit with the so-called undesirables, at least from the point of view of the farmers of Galilee, tax collectors, military officers, other elites, uh, because he knew that if he was gonna change the kingdom of God in Galilee, if he was going to change Galilean society, he had to start with the people with the power to bring about social change and to correct uh, the social injustices of Galilean society, as he as he said in Mark once again, you know those who are well they don't they don't have need of a physician, but the sick and he's referring to these elites who have been so incredibly uh, uh, unjustful towards 
the people of Galilee, who have really been exploiting the people of Galilee. Though those sick people, they need a physician. Well, guess what? In Jericho, Jesus encounters the success that he has been waiting for. He meets a very notorious tax collector. Now, this guy was notorious for the way he really pressured folks and, and harassed them, you know, by, you, get, you owe me this much money. Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, he's, he's in a tree. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down here, because you know what? Tonight I'm going to have dinner with you. Once again, the idea of dinner. Jesus uses the, 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 the grace of breaking bread as a wonderful way to sort of break the ice and, and really come on a very personal level with these particular prominenti, these very prominent people. And Zacchaeus is so, is so uh, impressed with Jesus that he, that he says, oh my God, I, I am a sinner. I have defrauded so many people. You know what? I'm going to pay them all back. Wow! Now, isn't that a shot on the arm after the very disappointing experience in Galilee, you know, with this, this, this outburst? That must have been a shot on the arm. That must have been, you know, Jesus must have felt, obviously, this is meant to be me going to Jerusalem. You know, even the apostles said they really thought that the kingdom of God was at hand. And here you see the importance of what I've been arguing throughout the uh, this podcast series the close correlation between the idea of the kingdom of god as a social construct to be achieved in uh in israel and in the near east of his time the kingdom of god was not just a heavenly promise for those who uh, were faithful uh, that after death they would receive the the kingdom of heaven no it was a construct that we had to be to begin to build right now. It's not something to be delayed until after that. No, no, it's a, something that we need to build right now. And you can see that because the gospels here make a very close inference between the, the realization of the kingdom of God and the success of converting Zacchaeus, a tax collector, by starting to undo the social injustices of that time. Well, and it's, you know, with that great enthusiasm, that wonderful positive spirit that uh, Jesus and the disciples uh, arrive in Jerusalem. And this is when many of them, not Jesus, as we saw, he's been here before, but uh, of course the, the temple was still under construction at this time. So in the intervening 20 years, a lot more had been built and they, they crest the hill. Here's that hill that you crest when you come from Jericho. And oh my God, they look down and they see this incredible sanctuary basked in the golden light of the sun. It's already late afternoon. Uh, and this is when they run down. <laughs> they, they cannot contain uh, their excitement, um, but of course uh, it's, it's too late. But fortunately, uh, very close at this point, when you crest the hill, it's still there to this day, an Arab village, um, uh, is the village of Bethany. And this is where uh, Jesus uh, had uh, people who were probably relatives, uh, Mary and Martha, and they were very, very close. I mean, the gospels all attest to the fact that Mary and Martha, who had a house in Bethany, were very close to Jesus and he was close to them. And this is a wonderful story, you know, any, any husband who's ever been, been chided by a spouse for not doing enough uh, homework, housework, <laughs> taking out the trash, will, will, will relate to this particular story where uh, Jesus starts teaching uh, Mary. And so it's up to Martha to run around and, you know, do the dishes and, and clean everything uh, because all of a sudden she has these guests in her house and she's busy cooking and saying, oh my God, uh, where, where are they going to sleep? And do we have enough food to eat? And all these things. Meanwhile, Mary, completely oblivious, is sitting, as you can see in this wonderful painting, uh, listening to Jesus' teachings. And, and, uh, and, and finally, Martha has had enough, you know, and she says, Lord, can you not tell Mary to come and help me? And Jesus says, Martha, 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 you are 
too worried about many things. There is only, there is need of only one thing, and that is the teachings of what I'm trying to tell you. Now, this is an extremely uh, unprecedented uh, moment, I think, not for Jesus, but for Jewish history, because what Jesus says is that he accepts women as disciples as much as men. He doesn't make a distinction between men and women, as many other sages did. Uh, he considers women to be disciples in every name and worth as, as men. And for example, Mary Magdalene is a very uh, prominent example of that. But even here, Mary and Martha, they are welcomed as Jesus as disciples, which is quite rare. In fact, it's a theme that I'm, I just finished writing about in a, in a new softcover book called Women of the Bible that hopefully you will see uh, uh, near the end of this year. This is not a pitch. I'm just saying that that's forthcoming. Uh, and then uh, the next day, uh, after they, of course, have a breakfast, and of course, they need to spend some time with Mary and Martha and hear all the stories of what's been happening. Uh, they finally make their way uh, to uh, the temple, uh, to Jerusalem, and this is when I think uh, the Palm Sunday events take place. And because um, Jesus is, is welcomed into Jerusalem, of course, his renown has now preceded him. And so many of the people in Jerusalem come out to welcome him, uh, and, and that's great. But what it also does is that Jesus is delayed in actually getting to the temple, which is the whole point of actually going to Jerusalem now. Uh, and so, well, clearly he's delighted with this reception, and, and people are holding his, shaking his hand, and they want to talk to him and all that, which is great. But then by the time they actually make it into the sanctuary, it's, it's too late to give that speech that he's been working on. And so as Mark says, it was already late. So, so they had no choice but to say, well, you know, this is not the time to, to make that speech. Uh, the guards are already closing the doors. People are already leaving the sanctuary. There are only a few people left. So he turns around and just as Mark says, he goes back to Bethany, spends the night and said, you know, the next day, we'll go and we'll finally give that, that great speech. And this is, friends, this is the 4th of Nisan, a very important date on the Jewish calendar. Uh, in my interpretation, we could uh, compare that to Thursday, April the 6th, in the year 30 AD. Uh, and that's when Jesus uh, comes to Jerusalem now, early in the morning. <laughs> and uh, they, they, they enter the sanctuary. And uh, this is a wonderful image because you can see that when you come down for Bethany, which is sort of roughly around here, okay, when you come down this road, the way to enter the temple, there were multiple entryways, you can see, was through this stairway, which led to the so-called double gate. And the double gate was a narrow tunnel uh, lit by torches. And it was deliberately made small so that when you come out of that, that tunnel and you see the overwhelming beauty of that sanctuary, you cannot be but deeply overawed. In fact, the steps of the sanctuary were uneven so that pilgrims had to ascend those stairs with great care uh, in order to really reflect on the great sacred ground that they were about to step on. Well, guess what? After the Six-Day War, when, as you know, all, all, the old city of Jerusalem was conquered by the Israeli forces, uh, taken away from Jordan, which in its own turn had conquered this area in 1948. Before that, it was all governed by the British mandate, so um, you know, Jordan couldn't really lay claim to that either. Uh, this area was excavated. And so look at the stairway. That is the stairway that we can still see today. And unfortunately, or fortunately, um, archaeologists have now restored it. Uh, only some of the steps here are still in place. You can see that, but you can see the uneven, can you see that? The uneven depth of these steps, so made deliberate, so that you, you had to really look where you were going. You couldn't just rush up. You know, you had to really reflect on the great, great 
uh, sacredness of what you're about to encounter. And so this is, I think, the only place in all of, of the Holy Land where we can say with great certainty that Jesus walked. If you're walking in the footsteps of Jesus, these footsteps, they were, would have been here. I can say that with great, great certainty. So it's the fourth of Nisan. Uh, it's the beginning, uh, the eve of Passover, when thousands of Jews were coming together in the temple to make their sacrifice. Uh, and, um, and that's when, <clears throat> of course, the city was suddenly, a city of 50,000, was suddenly overwhelmed by crowds. I think there would have been less than in previous years because of the, the great massacre that took place here recently. But still, it's a fair estimate to say that about 300,000 pilgrims were now descending on a city of only 50,000. Now, the rich obviously had booked the hotels and the inns well in advance, which meant that the, the vast majority of the people, who were obviously very poor, uh, would not have been living in the city. They would have been camping out on the Mount of Olives which is a very important thing to remember for our last podcast, the beginning of the Passion. I find it so strange that very few, few people have pointed that out. But the Mount of Olives at that time was not a quiet garden. You know, It was covered with, with families, with running kids, with campfires, peeping, make, people making makeshift tents or, or creating uh, makeshift beds, finding a place to stay for the night. Uh, so it would have been teeming with humanity, the Mount of Olives, on that particular, on that particular time. And now, here's the, the key problem. And this is where the, mo the, the whole sequence of events of the Passion is set into motion, which is that the whole purpose of Passover was for people to bring, at least the male head of the household, was to bring a lamb or a goat had to be male, had to be one year old, and most importantly, had to be without any blemish. Well, imagine a small city like Jerusalem with its little tiny alleyways, packed to the hilt <laughs> with pilgrims, all jostling, you know, trying desperately to get their lamb, which, which was purchased at, at, at great cost, through those alleyways into the sanctuary without an, the, the goat, the poor goat being kicked or, or hurt or, or having injury or a blemish. And if you had a blemish, then the priests in the, for, in the courtyard would say, ah, 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 unqualified, take it back, bring another one. And so these poor pilgrims, they had sunk a lot of their savings into getting a, a lamb or a goat. How to bring such a goat safely safely into the sanctuary when the whole place was so packed with people. And, and that was the problem. And, and so what the authorities did uh, in response for the first time, uh, perhaps also in response to the temple massacre, was they decided to bring the whole business of selling sheep uh, into the temple itself. That's what it, pre previously that was done again on the Mount of Olives. Why? Because that's where most, that's where your market was. That's where most of the people were congregating on the Mount of Olives. So previously um, they had set up stalls uh, where you could purchase uh, the goat and then take it into Jerusalem itself. But because so many people complained that the goats and lambs were hurt in the throng of the crowds, the authorities had decided for this Passover, at least, that, you know what, you can now buy that in the temple. So don't worry. You can go, you know, work your way through, through the city. And then inside the temple, you can buy the lamb. So at that point, there won't be any issue of it being rejected because guess what? The lambs that we will sell you there are guaranteed to meet the requirements of the priesthood. Well, that's a great improvement, right? You wouldn't have to worry. You could say, okay, great, I'll buy it over there, and then can walk straight into the inner courtyard and, and sacrifice my, 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 my sacrificial lamb. There was only one problem with that particular hypothesis, with that particular uh, shift in the campaign, is that you could not use Roman coins, or any other coins for that matter, 
into the temple precinct itself. That was a problem. How do we deal with that, the priesthood said? Obviously, we wanted people to, 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 to get here and, and get a, uh, an authorized and certified lamb, but we cannot have Roman coins in the temple. Why not? Because, as you can see, they carry the head of the emperor. And as we know, the Jewish law forbade any depiction of living beings, uh, graven images, and this most certainly is a graven image, as you can see, it's graven into uh, the metal of the coin. So how do we handle that? Well, somebody said, guess what? What we will do is when you come into the temple courtyard, before you go and buy your lamb, we will set up uh, a, a currency changers, money changers. Oh, what a great idea. Yes, so when you come in, uh, before you, you come into the holy ground, so in the outer courtyard, this is the outer courtyard, the, the courtyard of the Gentiles, where, where Gentiles could come and where these coins were tolerated. Uh, you, could, you could change from the uh, Roman coin into the only currency allowed in the temple, which is the Tyrian shekel, because it did not, it was only, it only carried symbols and then, you know, depicted anything. Besides, it had a very high silver content, <laughs> which also made it very applicable as a, as a currency. So anyone coming into the temple to buy a lamb to be sacrificed now first had to go to one of those stalls, those currency uh, exchange booths that you see throughout the Near East to this day, you know, and, uh, and change your, your currency into the shekel. And with the shekel then, you can go continue on, buy your lamb, and then go into the courtyard. Perfect, right? Well, guess what? Jesus was not at all prepared for that. He had Im imagined himself, perhaps from the days when he visited the temple as a 12-year-old, when he taught in the forecourt of the temple, he had imagined a large forecourt with throngs of people, and all he had to do was step on a soapbox and, and start to speak, just as Jeremiah had done. Instead, what he saw was this bazaar, <laughs> this, this, uh, this, this crowd of people first, you know, offering to uh, change your money and then to uh, um, sell uh, you a lamb or a goat guaranteed to be unblemished. And so he was so disappointed by that, by this commerce going on, obviously not a very good place or a good occasion to speak about the kingdom of God, that in a flash of anger, and we now see that Jesus, as a man, he was human, uh, though he was divine in this particular point, he is human, uh, in a flash of anger, he takes out his belt and he starts to chase the money changers from the temple, as, as seen in this beautiful uh, French painting. Um, and I think this is the turning point. Uh, because what he says then, is it not written, and he's quoting Isaiah once again, is it not written that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, a house of prayer for everyone who wishes to come and pray? And now he says something that is going to condemn him. But you have made it a den of thieves. Now he's quoting the, uh, the temple sermon of Jeremiah. But the Sadducees don't know that because the Sadducees don't recognize the books of the prophets, and Jeremiah is one of the books of the prophets. What's more, it strikes a nerve because just uh, less than two years earlier, Caiaphas, the high priest, and of course the whole coterie of chief priests were accused by the people of being exactly that, of being thieves, of stealing from the temple treasury, the korban, to build this so-called aqueduct uh, for Pilate. So the accusation, first of all, the whole turmoil, the riot of chasing people all over the forecourt uh, is, is guaranteed to prompt the Roman garrison up on the fortress overlooking the temple to come running out. Uh, and second of all, the temple guards are all upset uh, because this upsets the whole solemnity of, of the eve of Passover and the rite of sacrifice. And finally, it really is a personal accusation directed directly at Caiaphas himself as a thief. Uh, 
So um, Mark says, again, Mark is so close to, to, those, to those events. He says, as soon as the chief priests heard him say that, they were looking for a way to kill him. And, and many scholars, myself included, really believe that it is this moment, the, the turmoil, the riot in the temple, and what Jesus said, that's what prompted his warrant for his arrest. And that also explains now, dear friends, why Jesus could not go back to Bethany to celebrate uh, the Seder. The meal of fat, and I'm you know, I can imagine poor Martha and Mary, they probably were have been cooking all day. You can imagine that, right? They were the whole house, they've been cooking like like crazy, uh, to get ready because they know Jesus and the disciples are going to come back tonight, they're going to bring the sacrificial meat, uh, and they're going to use that, and we're going to have a wonderful Seder and everything else. So they've been cooking like crazy, but Jesus cannot go back there because obviously, the minute the arrest goes out, the minute. The soldiers and the guards are looking for him to arrest him. Uh, the portals, the gates uh, of Jerusalem will be guarded. That's the first thing you go. The first thing you do is you send your patrols to the gates to make sure that the people that you just issued a, 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 an arrest warrant for cannot escape. So the, the escape to Bethany was closed off. The only way to do, the only way to to, to, to do at this point is to look for another place to have the Seder, the Passover, and then hopefully, hopefully, under cover of darkness, to sneak out of the city and try to lose yourself among the throngs of the Mount of Olives. See how that now all makes a, logic, a lot of sense, a lot of logical sense in this sequence? So uh, that's why Jesus says, you know, he, he deputizes two apostles, say, go look for a place for us to have our Seder, which clearly, clearly shows that they hadn't planned on this. They hadn't planned on staying in Jerusalem. They had planned to go back to Bethany after the great sermon and then have a celebratory meal and, and see where things took them next. But that's not how things worked out. Jesus is now a wanted man, and so under, and the, the apostles, not Jesus himself, but he, he, he sends two apostles out. And these apostles, these delegates, which is the, really the Greek translation of apostle, it's called delegate, uh, they start looking for it. And they find one. And that's where they have the Passover meal. And this, of course, is where the great story of Jesus' passion begins. That's the subject of uh, my next podcast. So, uh, dear friends, I hope you will join me for my sixth and final podcast, where we will walk in the footsteps of Jesus as he goes through the Via Dolorosa, the road of sorrows, on the road to his place of execution and ultimate resurrection. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast, and thank you for listening.